Hello and welcome to TIFF Rewind presented by Bell. I'm Cameron Bailey and I'm the artistic director and co-head here at TIFF. TIFF is located on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. This territory is protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We're grateful to be working on this land and we're committed to learn and share more of the stories of Indigenous people here. We encourage you to reflect on the land that you're on and its history. I want to thank everyone who makes what we do possible here at TIFF, our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as our major supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. I'd also like to thank our members and our donors for their continued support. This year, we're inviting audiences to take a walk down memory lane as part of TIFF Rewind, presented by Bell. It's a free series of digital talks with filmmakers and actors who revisit past film premieres at the festival. You can watch the talks with special guests on TIFF's social media channels or on TIFF's digital platforms during the festival. With a Crave subscription, Canadian audiences can stream the films on the Best of TIFF's collection on Crave. And today, we're revisiting Training Day, which screened at the festival as a gala presentation 20 years ago on September 7th, 2001. It's my great pleasure to introduce our special guest, the director Antoine Fuqua and star Ethan Hawke. We are here with the director of Training Day, Antoine Fuqua, and one of its stars, Ethan Hawke. Welcome to both of you. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, Training Day, going back to 2001, premiered at the Venice Film Festival and then made its North American premiere here in Toronto as a gala presentation. That was a big night for us, but this movie has since become iconic. Uh, it's part of the popular, popular culture now. And I wonder for both of you, that night when you were in Toronto and you were showing it to a public audience, did you guys know what you had? Hmm. It's hard to know. It's hard to know. I had a lot of people come up to me afterwards and just say they felt it in their gut. I mm -hmm. remember people saying that, like they just felt like they just got like kicked in the gut. I wasn't sure if that was good or bad, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it was hard to know. But, um, then I started hearing people talk more about Ethan and, and, and Denzel's performance. And, you know, I, I kind of got a sense that it was, um, it was striking a nerve with people. Mm -hmm. I, re I remember the night it premiered at, at Venice, which was a couple days before Toronto, a friend of mine, a fellow filmmaker, Richard Linkletter was at the premiere and he was sitting down with Antoine and I, and he said to us, you guys made a classic. He said, this movie's going to be a classic. And I remember thinking what a good friend he was to be so nice. You, mm -hmm. you, you know, like I, and, I, and, he, and he was like, no, I'm, I'm not being nice. He's right. <laughs> He's like, this movie's gonna last time. He's like, it's, it's French, the way it's hard to do, a, to take the cop genre and do something different and revelatory with it in some way. But we weren't sure whether we'd done it. I can tell you that being around Antoine as he was, prepping for the movie, uh, you got a feeling that he was swinging for the back fences, mm. you know, um, when people would not give you something that you thought was important, uh, Antoine about a location. I mean, it, it, this, it, it felt life or death in his eyes. And for Denzel and I as actors, that's really exciting to be around mm. when you feel like, the person captaining the ship is going to do everything possible to make this thing work. And of course, Denzel was just in, he, he was in another, he was in, it's like, yeah. I don't know, playing with Miles Davis at the peak of his career, or playing basketball with that, you know, who would make whatever analogy you want to say, but every now and then somebody achieves they're they're working at a level of greatness. that's just beyond the ordinary excellence. It's, yeah. and we were, we were trying to keep up. Antoine and I. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, I would forget to yell cut often. Wow. I would just watch Ethan and Denzel. It's like a rhythm they had. And, you know, we had to drive the car around blocks and we had lights and crazy shit. And there was days where I would just not cut and just let it roll. And they would just start over. They kind of look at me like, are you going to cut? And I just, 
I was so captivated with them, but it was a reminder of why I love movies. You know, because I came up in music videos and commercials, so a lot of the visual aesthetics. And watching Ethan and Denzel in the car, it's like, I love actors. I love what they do. It's just like, it was a whole other level of experience for me. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to, sorry, I, I just wanted to, to, to say, um, I wanted to go back, you mentioned your music videos, you directed videos for Prince and Stevie Wonder and Tony Braxton, but you'd only had two uh, feature films, two action features, Replacement Killers, with Chai and Fat and Bait with Jamie Foxx before Training Day. Mm. How did you actually come on to the project and get to direct Ethan and get to direct Denzel to his best actor, Oscar? This seemed like it was a big project, a, a bit of a leap from those two. Well, not really. Um, you know, the, the short story is I, I was avoiding stories that had to do with the um, so-called the hood or the ghetto stuff I grew up in that I knew really well because I, I didn't want to get put in a box. And at the time I was developing and I'm writing a script based on Monster Cody's life, uh, the, the gang member who recently passed away. Um, I'm a new monster when he was up at Pelican Bay prison and all this stuff. And so, but no one would let me make that movie. It was a little too violent and I probably would have screwed it up because I would have made a story about him and not about his mother who was a real hero. Um, so David, Unger at the time was my agent. And he knew what I was really interested in making, the type of films I wanted to make. Um, I was experimenting with Bait and the replacement killers with Chow Yun Fat. It was just fun uh, as the first movie. But he got me this script and uh, he knew it was like in my wheelhouse. And I read it one time and it kind of went crazy. The way I got the movie uh, was uh, Pauletta, Denzel's wife. She told Denzel he should meet me because she oh. saw me on the cover of some magazine. Uh, it was a propaganda director. It was a group of us, David Fincher, Michael Bay, all of us. It may have been Rolling Stones or something. And she said, well, she looked up and she said, well, who, who's the black kid? And then she started looking at different work. And she said, Denzel, you should meet this kid. And Ad Lamato, God rest his soul, put it together. And I met with... Uh, Ed and Denzel at his house. And uh, he wanted to, I, I knew Denzel from church and he wanted to sit down and talk about the movie. And as soon as we sat down, it was just like, again, like Miles, it was like a rhythm. It wasn't even a, we didn't skip a beat. What you saw on the screen was kind of like our first meeting. Wow. Me and Denzel sitting down. We talked about it in the same tone, the same rhythm, and it never changed. And then when Ethan uh, came on board, it was just like, uh, I felt like I couldn't have gotten a better uh, script for me at that time. You know, but what I was most interested in, uh, you know, stories I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Ethan, you're working with Antoine and with this really strong script by David Ayer, uh, but you also have to develop a rapport with Denzel. And I wonder, you know, what, what, got you there in terms of that that chemistry that the two of you have in training day was that did that happen all before set or on once you were on the set or how did that develop well it's interesting you know Antoine I never heard you say that about Pauletta because sometimes I think that we all owe a lot to Pauletta because I'm not sure but I know that one of the reasons that you know Antoine and I had met and I auditioned for Antoine and and we had a great meeting I I yeah, like I how? Can't explain it. I, I remember the, there was a woman. We were we met in a bar to talk, right. and, and, a, and a woman at the end stopped us and said, "What are you two talking about? Because it <laughs> seems like the the room's about to catch on fire or something." <laughs> we, we just our conversation just exploded, and I was like, right. "You know, I can't explain it, but sometimes you got a feeling in your gut. You can use dumb words." I felt called to do this movie. I felt yeah. I was meant to be, and I needed to communicate that to Antoine. And I, I was so happy that we got along so well. Yeah. And the way, yeah. the way that he talked about the movie was when you first read the script, you could see it as a great Denzel Washington vehicle. And Antoine saw it as a great film. And he saw how to make it a great film and how important the world was and how important the community was and how important my part was. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And Every day from the time I met him to the time we finished shooting, um, Antoine treated me with so much respect. 
he treated me with the same respect that he treated Denzel. And I frankly didn't feel like I had warranted that kind of respect. But the beautiful thing about teaching people with respect is then they, if they are worth a damn, they try to be worth that respect, right? So mm -hmm. I, I tried to come in and be the person that Antoine wanted me to be, which was as good an actor as Denzel. I, I, I saw a lot of, I've seen every Denzel movie and I, I sometimes, the actor in my brain sometimes thinks people are afraid of him and they, they create room for him to be great, but they don't play their part. Mm. And that he can't, he can't act both parts. Right. You know, it's That's not fair to him to not play your best, you know, to just kind of constantly make room for him. And, and so Antoine gave me the respect. I think that Denzel was primed to like me because Pauletta had seen this uh, film. I did Hamlet and mm -hmm. she told you about it, Antoine. And like, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think she, anyway, I knew I had support from somewhere back behind, you know, the studio didn't want to let Antoine hire me. Um, yeah. But yeah. Paulina was, yeah. You know, I remember once Denzel saying to me, lucky my wife likes you, you know? <laughs> 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 and uh, Paulina's a big theater fan and so am I, you know? Yeah. And so that was, yeah. but the important thing I, I felt to creating rapport with Denzel is to do a good job. Yeah. And self respect, you know, you just got to do your work. And if you don't do your work, he's not going to respect you because he's working really hard. Oh, yeah. He's thinking he thinks deeper than most people think. His imagination is way deeper. And a lot of people don't even understand the way his imagination works. Yeah. But it's very it's very multi layered. Uh, he's yeah, he's he, quick. Denzel is so quick. When I first sat down with him, that's one of the first things he said. All right. Who's going to be who, who's your Jake? And I had no idea at the time. And uh, Pauletta told me about Ethan, and I saw him on a Tonight Show, one of the shows, interviewing. <laughs> and I was just like, it's just like a light bulb. And I said, that's Jake. That's Jake. Like, everything about him was Jake. And then, as Ethan said, we met for hours. We just talked, man. It was just like locked in. And I had uh, auditioned, I don't know, 12 other actors at the time with Denzel. I, he came in with me, and we did readings with each actor. Um, really great actors it was just didn't click yet ethan came in he was on his way to the airport and i called him and said could you come audition he, he was like i think he cussed me out and he said all right he canceled his flight and turned around and came back I was, I was pissed to have a screen test dropped on me on the way to the I know, airport i know it was like he, but <laughs> he he said, you're not gonna get the part if you don't do it so oh man but he came back and what's great is that he, he, he came back he came in the room. He had this look in his eyes. I said, oh, this guy's pissed off. He said, give me money. He went outside, came back in. Him and Denzel read it one time. And Denzel said, that's him. I'm out. And left. Wow. Like, Do you remember what scene you two read? It was, um, I, I think it might have been the diner scene when we first meet. I, I, I don't know. It, it was the diner. There's good scenes in that one, but it might have been that one. I remember mm -hmm. what was what was intense about it is when the scene was over, Denzel started make you know improvising with me. Yeah. And and that's when I felt I'd been this was when the challenge was set up. The gauntlet <laughs> got thrown. He started improvising with me and asked right. me what kind of car I drove and you know, yeah, I mean just it, yeah, it's a question about family, your wife, your yeah, kids. He wanted to see how big my backstory was. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, that was, and then I got the call from you saying, you're glad you came in, man. And we got, and I was like, all right. Uh, yeah, I was so was happy. Movie. Yeah, I saw the movie then with you guys sitting there together. When I saw mm -hmm. this, just riffing, it, I, I saw it. And I, and I remember calling the studio. It was Lorenzo de Bonaventura, and I told Lorenzo. And, he's, and he was like, well, okay, let's look at all of everybody. And Lorenzo, to his credit, saw it. And he goes, you're right. He's the one. Mm. And that was that. And we were off and running after that. But when I say off and running, we were off and running deep, deep in it together. Like, it was like Bone and Hitman and all the guys down there and, you know, the jungle and Nickerson Garden. Like, they were in there with me every day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we had some we had some wild days, man. We had it some was, wild days. You remember the day the Monte Carlo got stolen? Oh yeah. It was back <laughs> in the, 
<laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, but the guys were like, don't like, worry about it. That is a character in the movie. It got somebody stole that. Oh, Monte yeah. Carlo? But it was back, I think, within 24 hours, polished and cleaned, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. yeah, those guys down there said, don't worry about it. We got it. Yeah. <laughs> it was back in the exact same spot they stole it from, too. <laughs> yeah. It was, there was some we wild. We had a lot of support. We had a lot it was of support. One of the, one of the only times in my life that I can honestly say we were working hard and I would come home at night and I would be buzzing I, 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 with what happened that day. I, I just I would be replaying because you remember, Antoine, we just, so many takes would go different directions. And, and, oh, yeah. and you were so you were very confident and and confident and relaxed and really let Denzel play. And then Denzel was really encouraging me to play. And every situation we came in had a feeling of jazz to it, meaning that we knew what we were doing. We knew the melody, we knew the lyrics, but the mood and energy of it was shape changing all the time. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't clear what was the best path. We were just hunting. Every day, yeah. hunting, hunting for real beats, hunting for something that's not fake, that's not tired, yeah. something that's honest, something that's, you know, you came at this with a lot of experience. You brought in, you know, Antoine had Denzel and I do these ride arounds. That was new for me. You know, my brother's in the military. My brother has a lot of police officer. Friends. I had a, a hit on who I thought Jake was, you know, who, who I thought, where he came and all this from. But seeing that world, Riding around in LA, seeing it up close it was yeah. extremely. We had dinner with the gang members and some of the SIS guys. We had that dinner. You know, we kind of, it's really interesting, you know, to see the the police. Uh, I'm talking about the street police, SIS uh, type guys, and Ethan and Denzel and some gang members. And we all had dinner. And that was a really interesting thing to see, you know, the sort of respect and relationship they have on the streets, you know, the, the sort of. There's no secrets on the streets, right? There's no such thing as he's deep undercover. Like everybody knows everybody. It's just, <laughs> it's just what you're going, what they're going to let you get away with for what reason? Right. But there's no real secrets. So we got uh, the Latino gangs, the Bloods, the Crips, like really open arms to like come into these areas and film with all their support. They're excited about it, and I think what Ethan is was feeling as well was we, when we were going to the jungle we had set it up compositions and all that but sometimes you know people would flow in gang members would flow in and so right in the middle of them filming would be real guys like right in all up in there right and i'm not I'm, we weren't going to say get out the frame like some of them were right there you know so they wanted to be a part of it they all wanted to be a part of it so they were bobbing and weaving with real gang members and things like that within the scenes it was it was beautiful to watch too because you know denzel likes to talk to people yeah. and yeah. we would he i would watch him absorb the language that people were saying um i would he he would hear something that some guy said to us you know three days ago by a bodega or something like that and then it would come out of his mouth in an improv, you know, in a scene two weeks later, you, you know, yeah. it would, he, he's absorbing the world and absorbing the atmosphere and, and letting it ride through him. You know, and I'd never seen that up close. I've done it the rest of my life. I, I, I was watching the way that he lives inside a character and yeah. it was, it was incredible. It was, I mean, there were, you remember one time we were doing a scene with, you know, the Latin gang at the towards the end of the movie and oh smiley's the, house. Yeah, smiley says one of the guys, the actors that Antoine had hired had his production officer on set, right? <laughs> and this guy, he was he was really interesting. But while we're filming the scene, somebody's phone rings, right? And 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 the guy just picks up his phone. Hey yo, we're rolling. <laughs> we're rolling. Yeah, yo. No, nah, I'm acting in the movie. Uh, I Washington's supposed to be here, but he ain't even fucking here. <laughs> I don't know. And he's looking right at me. I don't know. Some white guy. No, he's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll call you back later. And, and, <laughs> and I just hear Antoine behind the camera go, all right, let's pick it up in the beginning. <laughs> oh, man. We need to see the outtakes. Oh, my God. Incredible. Oh, my God. Yeah. One of the other things you did 
uh, that I really appreciated. Looking back on the movie now, you've got all these people from hip hop culture, uh, from r and the R&B world in the film as well. Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre and Macy Gray. It really feels like this is a product of the LA, not just the gang culture and the cop culture, but the, the music world as well. And I just wonder, how did you get that woven into the movie as well? I you know I love Snoop and Dre, like they're friends. And um, I knew Snoop wanted to do more acting at the time. And I was trying to figure out how to use Snoop in the, in the film. Uh, and I, I think it was, I was on the streets one day with a guy, Bone, you know, who Ethan knows well, uh, who helped us out a lot. Uh, a lot, yeah. yeah. And uh, I saw one of the, one of the, one of the homies uh, in a wheelchair. And I, I thought, I'm gonna put Snoop in a wheelchair. And then it kind of evolved, you know, because then he was like, yeah, well, he started chasing me. You know, he had the whole idea of chasing me in a wheelchair. You know, just kind of like, like, like Ethan's saying, it starts to evolve because we were just in it. And there was things that we were seeing every day that we were translating as well, because it was really kind of happening down there. You could just be down there and, and see it. And so I, I did that. And then uh, with Dre, at first, Dre didn't want to do it, you know, acting and all that stuff. And then he kind of, he, leaned, he read the script and Denzel and Ethan signed on. And he was like, all right, I'm down. But also musically, I, I first started talking to Dre about music. But then I was like, man, you should play one of the crew, you know, one of his crew. And he was like, nah, I really think? I said, yeah, man. He's, I don't know about the acting thing. And I said, Ethan and Denzel, they got you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and then I remember Dre taking some gum out and started chewing some gum. You can see he was a little nervous. So he started chewing the gum to sort of help himself with it. But it became part of his character. And then he ran with it. But it was an environment with Peter Green and all the other actors and uh, Nick Shannon. It just became an environment with those guys as a crew. And I, I, it just kind of happened like that. Macy Gray, I met Macy before. And when I read the script, I think she reached out to me about it, or her agent. And then when I read the script with the girl, you know, you ain't no fucking cops and all that crazy. I just, I could hear Macy. Yeah, that voice she has. That voice. Oh, that voice. <laughs> that voice. Cause, cause, cause the thing was interesting is that, cause the movie was so intense, everything had to cut through. Like if you have Ethan and Denzel and you know, you got a scene like that, how do you cut through? Meaning how do you make it memorable? How do you make it cut through the performances I knew they were going to do? So I thought, oh damn, long, cause I grew up around this, long nails, you know, she got the Black Panther thing on the, on the table. You know, we just, started, it just, my memory started coming back to me as far as where I grew up and things like that. And I just thought, oh, Macy would be great for this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and her, and she cut through, she just cut through. Dre was interesting because he was so sort of laid back, but he's Dre. There's something about him that just kind of pops. And then obviously his music is crazy, mm -hmm. you know, that song and Snoop is Snoop, but it, it felt like it needed the full culture mm -hmm. to really be honest and the truth of, of you know, LA. You know, uh, people like Snoop and Dre came right off the streets, you know, and they're artists. But there's something about it, something about it that made sense. You and know? you got everybody, everybody bought in. I remember I was so impressed with Dre because we were shooting and it was Grammy night. And I think, you know, he won a couple Grammys and yeah. he came in at four in the morning to get his hair done the way yeah. he needed to have it done. That's right. He was ready. I mean, it didn't matter. He, yeah. he was all in. Uh, yeah. I, I expected him to be later. I expected him to ask for the day, you know, but uh, no, he was there ready at 5.30 a.m. to shoot. Yeah, Snoop and all that stuff. Yeah. It was awesome. They were all, you You had, we were, we were all bought in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, what I'm, what I'm hearing a lot is that, you know, you had a script, but there was a lot that came from just improvising, from responding to the environment you're shooting in and, and what the characters and the actors are giving you. Um, and that changed the movie a lot. There was another big piece of improvisation you had to do because, you know, four days after the movie was here at the Toronto Film Festival, 9-11 happened. Mm. And you had to delay the, the release of the film by a couple of weeks. And I just wonder what that was like responding to this incredible cataclysmic event. And you've got, you know, what you know is a great movie. You want to get it out there, but you have to change your plans. How did that work? Well, I'll tell you, I, I got to give Lorenzo de Bonaventura a lot of credit because you got to imagine Lorenzo at the time was running the Warner Brothers, uh, you know, the head of the studio. And you remember he had to take all, he had to take the movie to the shareholders and everybody and show the movie. 
and get everybody to sign off on that film being released at that time, you know? Um, and then they first saw the movie and the first thing they hear is my nigga. It was mm -hmm. like, <laughs> what is this? You know what I mean? And uh, to his credit, he pushed on, he pushed hard on it. Lorenzo was, he, he, he got in sync with us and he kind of stayed with us through the whole thing. And he really pushed hard to get it released at that time. Uh, it was tricky because we didn't have a premiere. We had a screening at the DGA. Uh, a lot of people showed up for the screening. And you could see people were in search for some truth. They were just, it was weird. It was like they didn't want to see a movie that was uh, watered down. 9-11, I think, woke everyone up to some truth of the real world that we live in. And at the same time, Rampart was happening, the Rampart case. With, uh, so I think people were just in a mood for something real. They went to, like I said, they, they kept saying, I feel it in my gut. Hmm. It makes me feel something in my gut. And I think that had to do with the world we were living in. People wanted some reality of things. Yeah. Obviously, it's a movie, but they wanted some reality. So we took the movie into as much reality as you can in the movie sense, you know, and keep everybody safe. Uh, and I think that's what people were feeling. And I think 9-11 uh, sort of sparked that feeling for everyone. They didn't want to be, you didn't want guys riding around joking, you know, riding mm -hmm. along. They didn't want any of that. Mm -hmm. They wanted something real. And I think that's what we were feeling. Mm -hmm. but Lorenzo pushed hard to get it out at that time. I was, we did the movie. I didn't even, I didn't know what was going to happen with the movie, to tell you the truth. You know, I didn't know. Day by day, we were just in it. Like Ethan said, I was kind of blinded. I was in this wild rage of I'm gonna make this movie the way we want to make this movie. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of blinded by that. And when we finished the movie, I knew we had made the movie we wanted to make. And I didn't, not that I didn't care. I was more of, um, I was proud that we made it through it safely mm -hmm. with the material we got. And I experienced something that woke me up to what I really love about movies, you know, which was seeing great actors do what they do up close like that every day. I mean, I just sit on an <laughs> Apple box right there. I, I didn't even look through the lens. I wasn't even at my monitor most of the time. I was sitting there like as close as I can get to Ethan and Denzel. Mm -hmm. And like I was in the scene, just like, <laughs> you know? And that's why I would forget to yell cut because the cameras and stuff would melt away. And I was just like, it was just like this magic that I'll never forget oh. that feeling. And I told Ethan one day, and I think Ethan thought I lost my mind. It was the scene with Chestnut Checkers. I said, man, we get this right. You guys get nominated. I don't know. I just I don't know what it was. And Ethan was like fucking crazy. Whatever, <laughs> whatever he said to me, Ethan, because he was in the zone too as Jake. So I think I was kind of like, yeah, get out, get out the way, let us do what we do. Yeah. But it was something that they were doing that I felt it, and it was like elevated. Mm -hmm. You know. I, and so yeah, I had a funny moment about three, four days ago, Antoine. I, I thought of you with this immense pride, if I'm allowed to say. I, I was in a pizza shop in uh, Bu uh, Budapest, right? I'm walking down the street, it's a, you know, you stop, I'm gonna get a pizza shop. And there's a guy who runs a pizza shop, just this Hungarian guy, but he loves movies. And he's got on the wall, you know, a big picture of Brando and The Godfather and a Pacino and Scarface. And he's got just five movies, but there's, there's Denzel and I in Training Day right up there on the wall. Oh, and I oh. thought, I thought about that first meeting with you, and I remember you saying, you, you said, I want to make Apocalypse Now. I want to make something as good as Apocalypse Now. I want to make a movie that works as a genre movie and works as a great film. Yeah. Like, I want, I, I I think this can be that. I remember thinking, wow, I bet it, it could. I mean, if we, if it could. It has that, it has the that in its DNA, you mm -hmm. know? And, and I thought, wow, if you could have told me back when we met that 20 years later, I'd be in Hungary and see our picture up there with these movies I love, you know, it was, uh, wow, man. man, it just, it felt, I don't know, it felt amazing. Well, we set out to do it that way. I mean, we, it was the time when digital was taking over film. And I remember after meeting with Ethan and Denzel and going through our process, there was something about, I said, you know, I got to shoot this on film. Because at the time, the studio was saying, no, I'll shoot digital. And I was saying, I got to shoot this on film. And not only do I have to shoot it on film, I have to shoot it anamorphic. 
And so now people are looking at me like I was crazy because it's got a moving car, anamorphic lenses, you know, close ups, got to be really on point, right? But if you look at the classic movies, those guys were so good at what they did. It was like a discipline that they had in the classic movies that we discussed. And I thought, you know, I'm going to shoot it that way. And my DP, Mauro, was like, really? I said, yeah, and on film. You know, we're going to do it. But it was because it was something about it that I felt that we had to be as filmmakers disciplined mm -hmm. to capture what they do. Like we couldn't get too caught up with lipstick cameras up in the ceiling and low cameras by the wheel where you're like, whose perspective is that, right? It was just like, I got to capture what these guys do, period, no matter what, and, you know, by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. And I need everybody to be on point. So when you know you're shooting film and you know you're shooting anamorphic and you know you're in a moving car, you got to wake up every day on point. Yeah. And those close-ups really add so much to the intensity of the movie as well. I mean, we're seeing a lot of it through through Jake's perspective, and you're just right there in each yeah. other's faces in that car right. and in the restaurant other things as well. Yeah. Um, I feel like I could talk for another hour about this, but I know we have to wrap up. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad to have had the chance to talk with you both and to have had the film uh, at the Toronto Film Festival 20 years ago and to have had you guys back uh, for Magnificent Seven and Antoine uh, for The Equalizer as well and, and uh, uh, Ethan many times for many of your films. Um, it's a real honor for us as well. So Ethan Hawke, thank you. Antoine Fuqua, thank you both. Thank and you. And the training day. Thank you so much. Thanks to Antoine Fuqua and Ethan Hawke for this wonderful conversation. If you're joining us here in Canada, you can head over to Crave to watch Training Day.